Thank you very much, Mirna. Thank you very much, Sonic Acts. Uh, thank you very much uh, to you, the audience, for bearing with me. Uh, I think I'm the last presenter in this conference. It's been extremely stimulating. Um, thanks for being here after maybe dancing last night in Paradiso to Rosa Pistola. It was a wonderful festival. Um, I'll just jump right in. Uh, just to say, uh, in 2017, I went to Bikini Atoll with Julian Charia. You could call it embedded curating. Um, we, I helped him with some of the footage, uh, film, uh, operate a camera for this film, uh, which would be uh, normally part of an installation that would include uh, sculptures and um, also photographic works in a museum uh, context. Um, uh, after that, uh, we decided uh, to pursue Bikini Atoll and our, and our journey there through a kind of retrospective narrative frame and we co-wrote a book from which I'll read uh, an extract and I'll just get right into it. Start the film, please. It started. Images are atoms of human attention. They combine to form molecules which, together, constitute the atmosphere of a culture. While particular arrangements of these molecules are experienced as discrete objects, they are nothing of the sort but complexes. One should speak of the identity of an island complex just as one should a painting, in terms of density, dynamics, or stability. The cultural space is a continuum of complexes as atmospheric conditions. We are always immersed. Sometimes we float, suspended within a specific condition for years, taking local equilibrium for a universal composition. Sometimes we swim. Bikini lies beyond the 48-hour delivery rule. A global network of cars, trains, and airplanes can only get you to the dock at Majuro, capital of the Marshall Islands, before an ocean journey must begin. There is no ferry, and only one suitable vessel is available for charter, the Windward, a beaten-up pearl diver from the 1970s. Once you have concluded negotiations with its owner, you can embark, entering a parenthesis in your life, a capsule, outside time and phone signal. Out in the wide Pacific, flows of energy run up against the beam, tipping the boat from side to side, constantly, in the spell it takes for you to become a sailor. The passage is an initiation, or sickness, that finally breaks with sunrise and the first sight of land. The island is a line of green floating on a raft of yellow sand, a shock of luminous color, like a gem set within another, the lagoon. It is a picture of the good as a geographical figure, so related in brochures promising space beyond the metropolitan everyday. You cannot help but recognize it as a place you have wanted, a figure centrally located in a dream that is our culture. It is only fully after fully indulging this reflex that your gaze steadies. For the last 70 years, it has been a veritable ghost land. Between 1946 and 1958, 23 of the most powerful man-made explosions in history, delivering a combined fission yield of 42.2 megatons, occurred here. The force of one of these, Castle Bravo, was enough to vaporize three islands and gouge a massive crater measuring 800 meters in diameter out of the primordial reef. Another through a fleet of captured and decommissioned World War II battleships, some of them more than 250 meters long, up into the air. A few were ripped to shreds. Others, like the USS Saratoga and the HIJMS Nagato, storied flagships of the United States and Japanese navies, respectively, eventually sank to the bottom, where their rusting hulks remain. During this period, Obliterated geology would become radioactive particles, carried on the wind to then fall on communities in neighboring atolls. Meanwhile, the people of Bikini, who had been asked to temporarily leave their home to make way for a series of experiments disingenuously ventured for the good of mankind and to end all wars, began to learn the meaning of a dispossession that continues until present. Today, the atoll bears architectural scars that stand as profane registers of this program and its unresolved consequences. A series of concrete bu bunkers jutting out from the shore, a terminal beach. 
Like a shockwave moving across the ocean to break upon foreign shores, modern history is the story of influence spanning great physical distances. Too often, however, spatial extension blinds us to functional proximity. But no distance on Earth resists the speed of light. And if we cannot feel the heat generated by this light, this does not entail any lack of fire. In the geopolitical Cold War, what was cold was only the surface of the pages and screens that bore the sign of the mushroom cloud. Bikini burned hotter than anything before. Settled by humans for approximately 3,600 years prior to atomic exodus, the 20th century history of Bikini stands as a signal example of modern techno-colonial hubris. Its English name is transliterated from the Marshallese Bikini, pick meaning surface, and ni meaning coconut, surface of coconuts. The biological fate of the island's namesake namesake flora, as well as the currency that the word bikini possesses today, are symptomatic of a profound historical ungrounding that has cut across biological, sociolinguistic, and civil fields. Following the test program, bikini was covered in a shroud of fallen palms, their fronds bleached by the nuclear sun. So many grain white bones piled on top of each other, high enough that the ground beneath them was obscured scatterings of coconut husks everywhere like skulls. Against this desolation and asserting that they must return home, the Bikinian people petitioned for a cleanup. This would eventually involve removing all the highly irradiated material from the atoll, namely everything, down to the land itself. Using bulldozers and diggers, the US military cleared the dead vegetation and a few living pockets that had survived the fire of hydrogen bombs. Then they scraped off all the topsoil Afterwards, they loaded everything onto a container ship, which undertook a week-long passage to Eniwetak Atoll. In an echo of the World War II atrocities which spurred the, the urgent development of this class of weapons, upon arrival, the heap was thrown into a mass grave, covered up and left to be forgotten. For on the Atoll's island of Runit, the US had refashioned a gigantic crater, formed as a result of one of the Yucca tests, as a storage facility. It was here they buried one homeland in the wound of another, underneath a concrete dome. This done, Bikini was nothing more than a strip of desert ri rising only inches above the water. Without tree roots to secure the sand, it would only be a matter of time before the island disappeared into the sea. Action had to be taken. And in order to again sustain human settlement, coconuts, a food staple, had to return. Following the rationale of industrial agriculture, new trees were laid out in a grid formation, a suitably unnatural modernist overlay. The coconuts grew and some people returned after a disastrous alternative settlement on Rongerik, another atoll, where the currents were wild and the fish poisonous. But it would later become clear that no amount of earth scraped away might enable a safe harvest. Coral sand is poor in potassium, and the roots of the coconut palm seeking this nutrient found a plentiful substitute in cesium. In time, the returnees were tested, and in those who regularly consumed bikini staple, dangerous levels of exposure were recorded. The atoll, so far from anywhere, would not be able to feed itself after all. Resettlement was abandoned. When one visits bikini today, some trees register a pronounced mutation their coconuts elongated, almost tubular, the shape of marrows or missiles, too narrow to produce milk or flesh. The fact that these coconuts stand erect like totemic phalluses, suggestive of potency, is another bitter irony. Coconuts of this sort are utterly sterile from a reproductive standpoint. That the Marshallese creation myth involves a paradigmatic mother giving birth to a coconut child, which then supplies her people with sustenance, tools, and clothing, sets the issue of genetic disruption into relief. And finally, of course, today, on the international cultural plane, Bikini's ungrounding plays out in its hegemonic linguistic identification. My MS word autocorrect allows Bikini, but not Bikinian. Rather than a place, a culture, or a people, their designation has, as we all know, become associated with something different. French designer Louis Riard named his women's two-piece swimsuit after the atoll in 1946, same year as the first bomb, trading on explosive media associations. 
the items ubiquity firmly established today in association with sun, sex, and leisure completely overshadows its namesake. And this is one of the reasons for the project and the photographic uh, series that results is looking again at the sunset beach and, and that image and how, how, how that token operates today. Now back to Bikini. The skiff pulls up at a short jetty running out from the beach of the most refined sand one might ever hope to see. The word unspoiled immediately springs to mind. Not a single thing floating in the water. Gentle waves lapping the shore. The brightness is phenomenal. We have radioed ahead and we are met by a pickup truck full of five young guys who, we will later, later understand, are nearly all of the island's current inhabitants. Our skiff isn't just loaded with camera gear, but also cool boxes full of frozen steak, tinned food, and beer for them a necessary courtesy if you call in here, a kind of exchange for the use of their vehicle and its precious limited fuel. Once loaded, we drive along a straight road flanked on each side by coconut groves for half a kilometer or so until we reach the geographical center of the Bikinian nation. It is a cul-de-sac. No more than 10 buildings, many of them clearly disused. A few are utilities, offices or sheds, as well as a tin building full of machine parts with a sign hanging above its door inscribed with the statement, we can fix anything except a broken heart. On the left, a fence surrounds a small parcel of land containing a few graves and palms. The island is narrow, like all of the others that make up the atoll, and most of the buildings are situated directly on the waterfront. To our left, the architecture looks familiar. There's a gazebo with a bar underneath it, and a few uniform bungalows on the edge of the sand, the remains of a defunct scuba diving resort. The venture was an attempt to establish an economic motor here, one that might eventually allow the island to support a more representative proportion of the Bikinian people. Its core customer base was to be dive tourists and their families visiting those wrecks that you see on screen. And it worked for a minute before coming to a quick halt. The atoll's remoteness, compounded by the incredible unreliability of the national airline, which frequently left guests stranded for weeks on site, as well as the misgivings that many holiday planners have about visiting a nuclear blast zone made it untenable. And that was it. Now, like the rest of the town, the resort buildings stare down an inexorable march towards becoming driftwood. Almost everything on Bikini Island is in limbo, a confection or a stopgap. The buildings that aren't rotten are on life support. The best kept of these is a diesel-run power plant administered by the US Department of Energy which supplies electricity to the other buildings. The main function of these buildings is to house the, work, house the workers who take care of the plant. That and a few unnecessary street lights, as well as the resort's air conditioning system. It's a simulacrum of a town, a mise en abime of utility. Given that they rotate on and off the island only once for a period of six months and mostly never return, the few persons residing here constitute placeholders in lieu of any settled community. In a kind of birthright scheme, Bikinian youngsters based in Majuro and elsewhere apply for a tour of duty, the only chance most of them will ever have to encounter their homeland. It is a kind of privilege to get selected. At least in terms of their official mission, those who pass through perform a minimal image of inhabitation, keeping things running according to a desiccated economic, industrial and spatial outline, putting diesel in the generator. Witnessing their honest attempt to work with the thin script that they've been handed to, to keep this place human and maintain a fragile edifice of occupation in the face of staggering dispossession affected by their people's enforced exodus does nothing to foreclose an impression of failure. It's sad. One of the most beautiful places on earth struck through with an unshakable sense of inertia. And yet, Without the aporia of the generator, this vortex of colonial infrastructure, there would be no birthright travel at all. No fishing on an ancestral beach. No swimming. No boxes of fish to address to their relatives back in Majuro for us to carry with us. We take the packages and promise that they will be delivered. Next morning, instant coffee as the sun climbs over the water, its rays casting an optimistic glow. The night's fog beginning to lift, we discuss the possibility of returning someday, maybe filling the resort with friends. We decide to walk around the town and check out the, the houses. Uh, opposite the mechanical depot, there's three steel shipping containers that have been welded together to comprise a makeshift building. 
above whose doorway is a, a sign is mounted, and it reads King Judah Memorial Laboratory. Judah was the last leader of the Bikinians to reside here. The man who agreed to nuclear exodus pressured into accepting the notion that his people should leave their, their ancestral home, again, quote, the US government, for the good of mankind and to end all wars. Here, in symbolic exchange for acquiescence to the greatest of geophysical experiments, stands his hollow recognition. As if his capitulation inaugurated a new age of scientific enterprise for his nation. As if, rather than marking a future of dispossession, participation in the nuclear project would, would secure the Bikinians a path towards the world's intellectual big table. The cipher for this putative legacy, out of sight from the rest of the world and crumbling away in front of our eyes, is nothing more than a shell, open to the elements, empty, and in no better condition than the rusting oil drums nearby. The laboratory, a gift from the US, is a lie. A lie so badly told and without effort that its offense issues as much from contempt for its audience as for the truth itself. An untended falsehood, a perjury disgracing science and humanity, rotting away at the center of an excuse for a society in a place that once was, an empty concession offered without care and immediately forgotten. You push the compressed foam buds deep into your ears. At first they do little to counteract the noise, but as, as they expand it diminishes, the boat's movement beginning to separate from the sonic dimension. You begin to feel like you've left part, part of the disorder behind, that you're less subject to it. In this, you think, intellect reaching out from the depths of nausea for a hold for a second, there is a symptom. Culture is subject to atmospheric conditions, which can include various complexes that are sometimes called the environment. Some of those who float within them are convinced that they are not immersed at all, but their outlook betrays a narcosis like the sort a diver feels when they've gone too deep for too long. When you are properly in its grip, you get sloppy. You forget both what you are doing and what to do next. Narcotic floating enables just letting things happen, running out of time, onwards to death. The floater's epistemological disorder, wherein they do not recognize the dynamic composition of their own image within the apparent environment, is no less dangerous. The earplugs work. You start to feel yourself calm as the last of the noise dissolves. You begin to nestle more deeply into the bunk's cocoon. Against unsettled surroundings, you focus on simple breathing. You want to re-inhabit your body without that churning feeling. The cot rocks again and again, deeper until sea change. That dizzy hope of shutting out the surge and retreating within now telescopes in reverse. Equilibrium is a tide you can feel, attending the dissipation of your body into the boat and the waves. A flow running out from your interior molecules to a blanket, a cot, a cabin, a craft, a crest, then another, another, still, bearing a plastic bottle in its foam, swimming like your thoughts through the Pacific. It is often said that people who are unaware of an imminent environmental problem or who imagine nothing needs to change are living in a bubble, you think, right hand pulling the blanket around your chest. Paying attention to a system designed to manage actual bubbles and sustain human life facilitates a deeper dream. The scuba circuit is a wave lifting you, carried by the hand of the boat, palm of the night. The scuba circuit is now falling further into reverie it is a microcosm, a microcosm of a body relationship with the surrounding atmosphere, mediated by technology and subject to clear resource constraints. Deeper. Technical diving is an object lesson, an intense reckoning with the reality of the atmospheric, that swirl of physical, biological, mechanical and symbolic conditions, their flows in and out of one another and our life within them listing now and rising, swell turning. It is a spring from which a vision of the relationship between culture and materiality emanates. The cabin rolls to port and your body too, almost out of the bunk. 
Your hands swim down each side of the mattress until they find the belt straps attached to the bed frame before drawing and clipping them together. It was always going to be like this. Now that you're lashed to the boat and the sea, you give over, falling away from the feeling in your skin and in your stomach, sinking further towards a dark keyhole down there. A line runs out from it to you. You swim in its direction, half drifting, closer. You reach for it with languid arms and slow hands. Your fingers clasp, it tugs, gently, willing your descent. You begin to follow it, one hand in front of the other. Pulling, slowly, a rhythm, an easy rhythm and the weight of gravity. Once you've begun, it requires no effort at all. The water column presses you on, one hand, then another, a meter, a second, more, further, onwards, one hand, then another, deeper. One handful of nylon, then another as you pick up the BCD, that clumsy assemblage, weighty and damp, sprouting a mess of belts, tubes and metal rings, harnessed to a pair of tanks. It always takes more effort than you expect to discover if it is up or down or inside out. Clinking noises as you heave it over your shoulders. Your left arm misses the correct hole, going between a rubber hose and a strap. Another attempt, this time correct. It is intensely heavy. You slump down onto a bench. Then you be begin to gather up a pair of straps around your hips, pulling them tight at the buckle. Then another pair, which clip together at your sternum, tighter still, digging a little into the bone. Plugging in, you notice that technology is a body atmosphere, an exoskeleton. Clothes are exoskeletons. So are cars and houses, just like the scuba rig. All are tools that supplement viability. One reason we fail to recognize this on the surface is because here, its markers are often so much bigger relative to our corporeal selves. More tightening. The terrestrial exoskeleton is not dense enough to perceive it as such. It's spread out, urban sprawl. Against this, the sea compresses the topic, pushing its registers back towards a corporeal measure. Air, it seems, has been the agent of our alienation. More layers of gadgets atop the BCD, itself atop the wetsuit. Clips, lines, bags, lights, a knife, a computer, fins, a hood, a mask. You stick a regulator into your mouth, connected to a hose that must deliver air from the twin cylinders strapped to your back. You test it. Having plugged your fleshy self into a pneumatic circuit made of rubber pipes, plastic, and beat-up aluminium, the crudeness of the construction repulses, and the first breath suffocates. You wake up with a gasp. You can taste the salt in your mouth, having sucked the damp from your pillow. You roll over, still tethered to the bunk. The boat is moving a little less violently now, and your mind's part surfacing grasps that the ocean is more Pacific. Still rocking, but with a steady rhythm, you start to drift again, deeper this time. A giant stride into, wa into the water, where the burden lightens. Descent. As you sink, investment in your rig grows. Above, it felt constraining. Now you are totally dependent on it to pilot and survive. Above, recognizing your reliance on a given technical apparatus seemed optional, an intellectual matter. Here, in the blue, there's no bubble large enough to support such vanity. Your head is no longer in the clouds. You lean forward a little, letting the weight of your tanks take over, pushing you into prone. You move your hands and feet without thinking, a crawling reflex, until you're ready to take that breath, the deeper one, the one imbued with a reordering of the relation between air and water, within you and without. That expansion of your subaquatic body in your mind and in your intentional drift into this place. On the beach, now facing the bunker, it was a filming station housing cameras to document the size and shape of mushroom clouds, 
so that each blast might be analyzed, so that bigger and better bombs might be brought into the world. With its four eye-like openings, the structure resembles a giant skull, a totem for an alien religion. Beneath, a gaping doorway beckons. The Geiger counter objects a little more than it did when we were on the boat, but not too much, so we go in. Rust and slime. It's like the inside of a mollusk. Stalactites of calcite drip from the ceiling, and flaking rebar pokes out from the walls and up from the floor. Throughout, a rushing sound reverberates. We're listening to the sea in a shell. Once back outside, we, ref we reflect on the meaning of the structure, whose hulking form now takes on a new valence, not just a building, but a camera body. At the time of the tests, the Abel and Baker tests specifically, 18 tons of cinematography equi equipment and more than half the world's film stock were present in bikini. Every bomb photographed and filmed from a multitude of ang angles. Whilst much of this effort served an analytic enterprise on the part of military scientists and engineers, it also had a propaganda function. It was in the Marshall Islands that the nuclear blast as an image project reached its apogee. A performance writ large attended by a huge public relations machine. This aspect of Operation Crossroads, as the testing program was called, rendered one of the most remote places in the world the most photographed. In this light, just as one talks about the science of the bombs or the testing of warheads at Bikini, one must also talk about the manipulation of the global visual imaginary, deploying pictures as munitions. But in order to shoot, the camera had to take on a new dimension. In fact, the photo negative has always been an invertebrate, reliant on an exoskeleton. It's as if, at the birth of the atomic age, it outgrew its shell. In order to capture the image of the bomb, its housing had to scale up to the dimension of battlements. In the manner of a hermit crab, it had to leave its old armor and crawl into the space of architecture. Built symptoms are standard mutations precipitated by atomic enterprise. The array of concrete housings on the beaches are the ruins of a studio a apparatus. Indeed, from its beachhead on the shores of Bikini, the atomic camera consolidated an image of the new world order. This order was the appearance of a second sun on Earth, a thermonuclear pro process summoned by US military industrial science. This image spoke of a capacity to reorganize the planet entirely, an energy that could move mountains, something akin to being able to spin the world in the opposite direction to affect day in the night and night in the day and sunrise in the west. Bikini's modern trauma issued from a desire to create an atomic iconography. A dense cloud of images resulted from the explosions there, particles of which continue to circulate today, constitutive of our cultural atmosphere. After it was a homeland, Bikini became an image production factory. Indeed, the atoll is central to the development of photography, as I've just mentioned. Looking at the structures that house the cameras, that produce the pictures, which conditioned the historical imaginary, offers a lesson of a sort. And that is, all images come from a place, a ground. Even if, today, we imagine that culture is nothing but a sea of images, that everything is fungible, there are islands where this idea is rooted. A vision of mankind as a civilized scientific agency planted like a coconut tree in irradiated soil. The days and nights pass, one after the other. The routine, gearing up, jumping in, sinking, equalizing, breathing, ascending, emerging, resting, then jumping back in again long walks on the sand, or shuffling through the jungle with crates strapped to our backs, lugging gear through pandanus groves, walking atop generations of palm fronds, attending concrete temples. At the bottom of the lagoon, you are staring up at the inverted bow of the dreadnought USS Arkansas, which looks like the gigantic dorsal fin of a behemoth, something between machine and animal, a tower or the face of a mountain. Its figure rises against a color field of dark blue. 
but this optical minimalism is no void. It is completely full, a dynamic volume that pushes against you, around you. Every part of this volume is in motion, and there's no way to take a fixed position. You can't even stand and meditate. You're being pulled all over the place. You have to, a fight, you have to fight to approach the wreck. If you manage, on first sight, the broad outline of its figure might seem simple, but in detail, it is another teeming hive of life. Things are crawling over it, growing out of it, circling it, moving in and out of it, hiding behind it, and nestling within its cracks. To look at it, you have to breathe in a certain way, to control your body as much as respire. To get here and look at it, you have to squeeze into a second skin, strap on weights, bite down on the hose, and trust in a material outsourcing of your lungs. You have to study a system and follow it, believing that you are ready to approach the scene. You have to cast off from a life world you know and commit yourself to another space, its atmosphere, understanding that you cannot stay. It is more than any artwork has ever asked of you, more than any church you know about. It is the greatest installation in the world. It wasn't put here to be loved or looked at. It was put here to be forgotten. You are looking at one of the largest human constructions ever offered in sacrifice. Think of the mythos that this object encapsulates, how it enchanted industrial creation. Think of the hundreds of people whose labor served to manufacture it, and beyond them, the millions more mobilized in its service. All of this is implicated here in this object, a vessel in the truest sense of the word, containing the will of its creators. Think of the will of the vanquished also, obtaining in the Nagato and others, likewise given up to a tumult of fire and fury, then see. These vessels too, along with a whole way of life that had no stake in such an enterprise, rendered unto a victory ritual of an entire modern order, the experiment. Today, we pass the bones in what must be considered an underwater museum. If it is not a museum, then it is nothing at all. And if it is nothing, then we have not learned, and Bikini never mattered. But it mattered to them. And if Bikini doesn't matter to us, then how can we be sure that anything we attempt ever can? This museum is a place without labels and minimal on-site interpretation. Its sole garden is, guardian is George, a dive leader, the only Bikini equipped to enter it and he's employed ad hoc. Here, 60 meters down from the impression that all is sunny, is an atrocity exhibition, gathering together the insane cult objects of the world's leading industrial powers. It is underexposed, almost lost, and that's what's crazy about it. Bereft of true resettlement and attention, Bikini is asleep, and through its sleep, the outlines of the present blur as if we are dreaming. Few will ever visit these ships, and so their resonances are unfelt. But they comprise a museum. This, I assert. And every museum presupposes a public as witness who, through attending, become a community. Without visitors, a museum can't shape identity, that locus of care and thought. A lost exhibition hardly exists at all. Though named an essential part of the world's heritage by UNESCO, Bikini's wrecks are, in practice, a private collection, less accessible than the most exclusive vernissage. Against the very concept of public good, their display is only available to a few. This is one of the most significant exhibitions ever opened. No one was invited, and hardly anyone knows about it. We should raise these ships and deposit them on the famous squares of the world, Trafalgar, Concord, the Washington Mall, like beached whales. We should haul up these rotten tokens of, of a civilization we have yet to overcome. 
what's unrealistic about hoisting the wrecks of Bikini Lagoon, transporting them across the globe and installing them at the center of our leading nation states at a cost of billions of dollars. What's impractical about burning fuel enough to power the armada it would take to carry them back? How is any of this expenditure, pollution and effort unrealistic compared to the power and waste effected during their genesis, not to mention their sacrifice? Comparatively speaking, it's a modest proposal. But we can't bring the ships back. And while it's obvious that there is no medium capable of capturing the experience of encountering them here in the lagoon, we must try. At the end of the world, and a journey deeper than we ever imagined, we float, facing sights that defy our powers of comprehension, to say nothing of representation. Can we fix them in an image? No. It's clear that any attempt to place this reality in a single reckoning is doomed. There's no frame big enough. In this atoll, reverie flows like water. One image leads to another. A photograph leads to a film. A film leads to a book. A journey leads to a story that we tell once, twice, again and again, at the bar, after dinner, in this room, to anyone who will listen. Sometimes the currents are navigable, moving in and out of the lagoon. A tide pulls us out into the past, that ocean of what has come. Another carries us into days that have yet to be, and all that we want to say. But there are also vortices, orbiting a mass of dreaming as dense as a planet, here, at the center of the atoll. In them, our images move. People recognize the signs, but don't know what we mean. We say, bikini, bikini, and people answer, yes. We promise something clear, but it's nothing of the sort. Adrift, we can only embrace the current, heading forward into the past and backwards into the future. In this tide, there's no swimming for sure. Bikini, bikini, we never left your lagoon. The truth of our drift is submerged somewhere in the South Pacific, deep past gun turrets and propellers, over the edge of a hull, beyond the monstrous hulk of a battleship, amid a column of seawater running over coral sand, out into the blue. It is a tide containing us, witnesses, image makers, as we used to float. Thank you.